Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you listening right now. Thanks to all of you, including Peter Bohack, Philip Less, Howard Yermish, and our brand new patron, Joe. Yay. Welcome, Joe. Woo-hoo. On this episode of DTNS, Space Telephone Service comes for T-Mobile in North Carolina, what you need to worry about regarding 23andMe, and why Apple may abandon the yearly upgrade cycle. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, October 7th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From the Edge of Atlanta, I'm Nika Monfort. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. You know, technically, I'm as far from the center of Los Angeles as you are from the center of Atlanta, but that's just how wide Los Angeles is that I'm still in the city. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's crazy. Uh, Well, folks, uh, the final ruling in Epic versus Google in the U.S. has been issued. The new rules where Google has to let third-party apps into the Google Play Store, allowed third-party billing, all of that stuff. Uh, The decision says that all begins on November 1st. So look for lots of cool new apps in your Google Play Store starting November 1st, in the United States anyway. Now to the rest of the quick hits. Wall Street Journal reports that Verizon, AT&T, Lumen Technologies, and a few other network providers were breached by malicious hackers thought to have originated in China. The report says the attack was discovered in the past few weeks, and attackers may have had access to the networks for months or longer. The areas infiltrated included the system used to fulfill law enforcement requests under the Patriot Act. It's unknown what method was used to gain access to the systems, how much access they had, and what, if any, systems were accessed. So they were in the system doesn't mean that they got the Patriot Act uh, wiretap data, but they might have. We'll find out eventually, I suppose. Maybe. A couple of uh, Google-related rollouts. The $199 Galaxy A16 5G is the first Samsung Android phone to come up with a promise of six whole years of Android feature and security update. Updates. It's believed um, to the first to be the first phone in that price range to promote updates for that long, and the first people on the wait list are getting access to the Google's Ask Photos feature, which lets you use natural language to find photos in your library. When activated, it will work across your account, including both iOS and Android apps. Very nice. During the Halo World Championships on Sunday, 343 Industries announced it's changing its name to Halo Studios because that's what they do. They make Halo. The Microsoft-owned developer is also moving from its own slip space engine, which is getting a little dated, they say, uh, to use Unity's Unreal Engine. The company also showed demonstrations of Project Foundry, which is its research project into making Halo games on Unreal. Uh, it says it's been conducting those for several years. 343, nay, Halo Studios also said they're going to hire more developers. They're going to create multiple teams working on several games at once and use a centralized Unreal Engine pipeline to manage it all. Philips updated its Hue app to include a 3D modeling tool that can show you what your room will look like under different lighting conditions. If you have an iPhone or an iPad with a LiDAR sensor, you can test up to 12 different Philips Hue products, including the Twilight Sunrise Lamp, Dimera Wall Light, and Infuse Ceiling Light. Before you buy them, all and all Hue um, apps users get access to the Do Not Disturb mode that lets you set motion sensors to only react if all the lights in the zone are turned off. And the largest publicly traded water and wastewater management facility in the U.S., American Water, told the SEC that it had shut down some of its systems Thursday because of a network systems breach. The company shut down its customer portal and paused its billing services, saying it will not issue late charges as a result. It shut down a few other systems, but it does not believe any of its actual water or wastewater facilities were impacted. So you're going to see the headline. You're going to jump to the conclusion that, oh, they they got into the water system. doesn't appear they got into the water system. Looks like they got into billing systems and a few other systems. So feels more like a normal breach, but it's not good to be into utility systems at all. So that's why we're passing this one along. And that's a look at the quick hits. We have some better news than that coming up. 
The U.S. Federal Communications Commission has given Starlink and T-Mobile special temporary authority to offer direct-to-sell satellite service in North Carolina to help aid in the recovery of the effects of Hurricane Helene. Emergency alerts have already started to be delivered through the service, meaning some people will get some information in areas where there is no cell service otherwise. SpaceX, which operates Starlink, said, We may test basic texting capabilities for most cell phones on the T-Mobile network in North Carolina. SpaceX's direct-to-sell constellation has not been fully deployed, so all services will be delivered on a best-effort basis. So, Nika, basically what they're saying is, we can get emergency alerts to you, but we may not have the infrastructure quite yet to provide constant text message service between phones to everybody. Uh, but still, this is better than not having service, which is what a lot of these areas were suffering from. Absolutely. I mean, being completely cut off from the entire country during a major storm where you really everything in some instances were completely wiped away. I will also throw in the fact that um, if you have iOS 18 um, for Apple um, iPhones, you can take advantage, and I saw on social media a lot of people were taking advantage of the uh, SOS uh, messaging feature. Basically, if you don't have cell service, you know, Apple taps into the satellites and allows you to message emergency personnel back and forth so that you can get some help, pinpoint your location. So it's one of those things where it's not a very sexy feature, but when something like this happens, yeah. it's like, oh my God, I'm so glad that I have this particular feature. But I think it just goes to show that the government is really pulling together different pieces to try and assist people in probably one of the most catastrophic hurricanes since probably Hurricane Katrina. And, um, you know, doing all the things that they can to help mitigate these issues and get people back online. Now, I, I know Georgia wasn't hit as hard as North Carolina, and you're in Georgia. It sounds like you still got hit pretty hard there. Yeah, yeah. Um, my parents live a few hours away from here um, in our town. 75% of the roads were blocked either because of power lines or, or water. Um, a tree fell in my parents' house. They have a huge hole in the roof. Oh, no. Um, yeah. And so, you know, even, you know, I've talked to people, you know, in that area, and it's still completely, it's, it's pretty bad down there to, to get people um, to get help. And if you're closer to the coast, towards Savannah, you know, it, it got even worse. But even up here through Atlanta, a week later, um, just over the weekend, I, my, I lost my power and my cell service from remnants of, of Hurricane Helene. And I was down without power and cell service for about 12 hours. So mm -hmm. it's one of those things where it, while we particularly didn't get hit as hard, there are certain areas, even in the metro Atlanta area, that got hit hard. So it's one of those things where it just, it really goes to show the power of the storm and where it kind of hit. It completely missed some areas and, you know, completely demolished others. So um, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's really sad. And there's another one coming up uh, on the hills of, of Helene. So it's one of those things where I just hope people are, are prepared and, and safe and, 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 you know, are out of harm's way as much as possible. Yeah, it was it was good to see the regulatory agency leaping on this uh, quickly. AT and T and Verizon have been uh, objecting to this service, this cooperation between Starlink and T Mobile, because they say it could cause ground interference with their own networks. And there is some validity to their concerns. Uh, most of the people I've read seem to think that they may be exaggerating the concerns and that they are addressable. Uh, I think it was good of the FCC to say, I know there's concerns about this, but this is important. We need to make this happen now. And I wonder if it will actually ease the way forward uh, because this is a system that is being put together and they're mm -hmm. ramping it up past what it can do to provide some service. Uh, but in the future, you'll have multiple services, not just Starlink, uh, yeah. but other satellite services and other cellular companies partnering with them, which means you can have this kind of capability, this kind of communication capability, even if power out outages are even more widespread than they are in North Carolina and Georgia. Right. And it may be one of those things that this may be included in the FEMA package now, um, that, you know, they deploy it when something mm. like this happens just to have, you know, backup to the backup in, in yeah. case, you know, it goes down. So this may become a new standard. Yeah. If the satellites are already in the air, the service is already in the air, then you just need to, you know, drop the billing, you know, compensate yep. the, the company for its costs of operation and, yep. and get information out to everybody.
Yeah. Uh, well, okay. From good news to not as good news. Uh, a lot of you may recall that 23andMe suffered a breach in December last year. Uh, the breach affected account data of around 6.9 million users. That's about half of 23andMe's customer base. Customer base is around 15 million. And at the time, I was quick to calm people to say, this is not a great breach, but it's your name, your birth year, your relationship labels with people, which is something you might not normally have in a breach of this kind, uh, the percentage of DNA you share with a relative. So I'm, you know, got the same 80% DNA, the same as my mom's, for example, so stuff like that. Some ancestry reports and whatever location you put in there. Most of that stuff is the kind of information you would have in most breaches. The relationship stuff is not. So it makes it a little more serious. It did not include genetic information which I think a lot of people just seeing the headline would think, oh, it's 23andMe. Now they have everybody's DNA. They did not get that. Yeah. Still, a lot of family information. So I don't want to minimize the seriousness of the breach, but it wasn't that serious. Uh, the breach combined with general declining interest in DNA kits, though, has caused 23andMe's revenue to continue to decline. Uh, it was declining before this breach. The breach certainly didn't help. In early September, independent directors resigned from 23andMe's board, citing a lack of faith in CEO Ann Wojcicki's plans uh, to take the company private, uh, saying it didn't look like she had the right plan to save the company. And then a New York Times story over this weekend kind of fanned the flames, uh, pointing out that, well, you know, in a de in a desperate moment, they might sell their database to somebody. And then who knows uh, what that company might do uh, with your data. Nika, I look at this and I think uh, not that The New York Times is being irresponsible, but it's it's uh, it's pointing towards something that's a lot very much a might be. I think there's enough public pressure and enough public scrutiny, especially on 23andMe, uh, that if they did have to sell to someone, that there's going to be a lot of attention paid to who is the buyer and whether that buyer should be allowed to buy it and what terms are on that database. So that database is probably safe from being sold to someone irresponsible because of that, more so I'm concerned that 23andMe, because of its financial problems, won't have enough money or morale to make sure that your information stays safe and that a, an attacker could get into the database and get, get the data directly. Yeah, I think that's the biggest issue. It's the what if. It's yeah. the what could happen. Because, you know, it's one thing to say, you know, uh, you know, you have my social security number, you have my PII data, you have my face scan from my iPhone or when I walk through the airport or you have those types of things. And the one thing you don't have is my genetic matter. And that's kind of like the last piece of of what makes up a person. And when you have the threat or the potential that that last piece, the actual physical DNA matter that can be sold to God knows who, I think that really, you know, inflames the situation and it does allow, you know, news agencies and organizations to, um, you know, sensationalize it and it, you know, really turns people up. But as you mentioned, in this particular breach, there yeah. was no, um, you know, breach of physical DNA matter. To me, it says, but what if? And I think that's where a lot of people are, are hung up on the, the what if part of this, because, you know, who's to say what you can do with someone's actual genetic matter? And I mean, you never know. I mean, conspiracy theory, theorists, let me put my tinfoil hat on. It's one of those things with I'm in the technology space, I'm in the data space. And it's one of those things where you never know what people are doing in their R&D, what they're creating, what they're thinking up. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things where it's like, oh my gosh, it's the, for me, it's the the what if. I would love to, you know, do one of these ancestry things. I always wanted to do one, but I would never do it for the specific reason that yeah. my genetic matter could be exposed. So I think it's one of those things where, um, you know, folks are, are, are a little, you know, anxious and, and want to, you know, make sure that their data, if they do have currently a 23andMe 23 account, what to do to 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 mitigate this or get them like, you know what, I'm, I want to off this space ride. I think there's little generalized fear, uncertainty and doubt around genetic data because people don't understand what it can and can't be used for. It can be used mm -hmm. for a lot less than people think. Mm -hmm. I personally am not 
as worried as other people. And that's not to say I'm not worried, but I'm not worried as worried as other people about genetic data getting out there, uh, partly because it's easier than ever to sync, you know, to to um, to to run someone's DNA. It's not hard to get a hold of people's DNA. If somebody really wants to get your DNA, they can't. Uh, they they just need to get you know close enough to you to gather a small amount of ge genetic material and then and then run it. Uh, it's not impossible. No. I think the 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 opposing viewpoint to me on that is yeah, but twenty three and Me makes it real easy because you gave it to them, so they don't have to come and try and get it from you. So I think it's reasonable to be to be thinking. You know what? I'd rather put a speed bump in their way. I know they could get it. Uh, I'm not a high value target. Let's not make it easy for them to get yeah. it. I don't know what they can do it do with it either. Uh, but you can. I'm not going to help your, them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you, and I think that's reasonable. Yeah. Uh, it, you can delete your data by going to settings, 23andMe data. Select delete your data. They'll send you an email to confirm it's you asking to delete your data. You can confirm it, and then 23andMe says it will only keep the personal data required to by law. That that means business record. That means like, oh, we had you as a client, so we will keep your name and that we paid that you paid us at this date and even records that you deleted it. But they will get rid of the genetic data, they say, uh, and they will destroy the samples. Uh, that will also happen if you delete your account uh, as well. So you can you could just delete the whole account. Uh, but you could actually delete your data without getting rid of, of some of the account information if you're not too worried, if you're not as worried about the account information, because some of it's already out there. Maybe you want to keep that. You've got options uh, if, if you want to get rid of this. But I, I do think it's smart to play it on the safe side. I wouldn't panic about it, though. It's because it's not it's I don't know if it's as highly valued and useful as you think. A lot of smart people, though, are pointing out that deep learning is getting better and better about figuring yeah. stuff out. I still don't know what you would use mass DNA data for that would harm me directly. But that doesn't mean it couldn't happen. You're going to clone me and make multiple <laughs> versions of me. <laughs> I don't think we're close to that. But again, if you want to make sure that you're as far away from that as possible, you right. can delete your data. I don't want to make it uh, easy for you. If you have feedback about anything that gets brought up on the show, uh, you can get in touch with me or my clone on social media at DTNS show on X, uh, on uh, at DTNS show at mstdn.social on Mastodon, at Daily Tech News Show on TikTok, and DTNS Picks, DTNS PIX on Instagram and threads. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman sources say Apple will announce M4 powered 14 inch and 16 inch MacBook Pro models, an M4 iMac, and a new M4 Mac Mini around the end of this month, around the end of October. Just as everybody has suspected, Gurman saying, you know, and he's good at this stuff, you're probably right. Uh, he also expects there might be a refreshed iPad mini in the mix and that most of the announcements will ship November 1st. Few of them might slip till later in November. Uh, none of that is particularly surprising to me. We've been talking about this, hearing about this. There's often a fall announcement with right. iPads and Macs, so it wouldn't be so shocking to see this. What's more interesting in Gurman's column is his identification that Apple is moving away from a yearly release model for more products. Older products don't get yearly upgrades, so we don't get a new MacBook Pro every year, but the most popular ones, like the iPhone, like the Apple Watch, do. And the operating systems always do. If the cadence is, right, WWDC, they tell us what's going to be in the new operating systems. The betas come out for the developers, then they come out for the consumers, and then in the fall, they release the new operating system updates, and that comes along with the new iPhone and the new watch and the new iPad and the new Macs, right? That's the cadence, right, Nika? Right. Like, you're, you, yep. you're used to that, yeah. Yep. German That's thinks they're moving away from that. Hmm. He points out that the Apple Watch Ultra didn't get an upgrade this year, uh, that the Apple Watch SE also skipped an upgrade this year. He thinks those are moving to a two-year refresh cycle. And bigger than that to me is he thinks the delayed rollout of Apple Intelligence is a sign of things to come, that the big OS upgrades will not launch with all their features at once anymore in order to make sure that those features are ready when they are launched. So not that we won't get fall point upgrades, you know, version upgrades, but that features might start to roll out continuously throughout the year instead of all coming in the fall. Hmm. What do you think? So for me, I honestly think Apple intelligence, I think they probably planned for it to actually come out 
uh, in the fall announcement and it just wasn't ready. I don't mm-hmm. think to me, I don't think it's some grand master plan to reconfigure the way that Apple announces its things. I, I personally don't, I don't think so. Um, I just think Apple intelligence wasn't ready. Um, and, but I, I, I personally, I don't think that I like the piecemeal kind of rollout. You know, give me a heads up if you're going to say, you know what, we plan to release, you know, features one through five, you know, in in October. And then, you know, we're going to do some other features down the line. Sure. But I think, you know, completely pivoting on the way that they roll things out. Um, I don't know. I'm I'm a little suspicious with that concept. I don't know if, um, you know, that plan of a concept is, 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 is nailed I, down. I, in, de, in defense of this plan, if it is indeed the plan, uh, which, you know, German's suspecting it might be the plan, mm-hmm. which is, for German is saying like, I get the sense, not somebody told me. Mm-hmm. Um, but it would make sense if Apple, let's say you're right. Apple intelligence was supposed to come out along with the phones. It wasn't ready. They made what I would call a good call of like, don't mm-hmm. push it out when it's not ready yet. Absolutely. Wait till it's ready and put it out when it's ready. That could be the impulse for them to say, you know, we should just make that the policy is that, you know, we'll upgrade the platform capability and the security. Uh, well, I guess security updates come regularly, but we'll up, yeah. we'll update the platform's capabilities in the fall, but new features like this, we'll just push out when they're ready. Like this could be the, the inspiration for them to do that. Mm. It could be. I mean, I, I, I don't completely disagree with this premise. It could be that way. I just, for me, kind of, you know, just like the piecemeal version of features kind of just coming out, you know, out of the blue. Um, it, it, it definitely steps away from the ethos of Apple being very controlled, being very intentional with how they release their products. To me, it feels a little bit too loosey-goosey for Apple. Maybe they're changing, maybe they're evolving, but to me, it just seems um, outside of the the Apple standard and their typical, you know, straight line, this is how we do things. Now, what I wouldn't be disappointed at if, if this kind of rolled over into like Apple announcements. Um, we've talked in our show, um, some of these things that they're, you know, announced in these big events could have been an email, um, could have been a video uh, posted on the website, something going out on social media to say, hey, we have this new piece of hardware. It's out there, you know, go for it. Rather than, you know, piling stuff into an, an, a physical event or a virtual event just to kind of fill out the time. I would prefer if they were streamline the events yeah, and yeah. No, I'm not with put you. some of the things in there that, you know, like, honestly, who cares? And they have been doing that. Uh, I yeah. mean, that's a side note to this conversation, but yeah. uh, it's October 7th. Uh, if Apple's going to have an announcement for Macs by the end of October, we should be hearing about it pretty soon, right? Yeah. Uh, so it could be that there won't be, that mm-hmm. they will just do what they've done a couple of times where they just put out a video they just, they don't schedule an announcement. They just drop a video. It's like, here's the new max. Yep. It's a 15 minute video. Enjoy, which I love <laughs> personally, like you, yes. like what you're saying. Uh, or they could just drop a press release. I think press releases are usually saved for spec upgrades. Uh, and I guess these could be spec upgrades, but with an M4 chip, I feel like they're going to want to talk about the M4 chip more. Uh, so I, I would, ex- I would suspect that they might just come out, uh, with a video on these and not do a big event. Um, but what's interesting to me is that we had an iPad OS update that is out and available and there was no new iPad to go with it. Mm-hmm. I could see, and that's the other thing that German's talking about. This becomes, well, the iPad OS update won't come out on the same day as all the other updates. We'll bring it out when there is a new iPad to, to go with it. 
uh, or the iPad OS update comes out in September, but one of the new features launches with the new iPad that we're announcing so that yeah. they are they are coming at the same time. Uh, I, I could see them doing that. I mean, it's not like Apple hasn't launched features throughout the year. They they right. they do add features throughout the year. But I think German's saying it's going to be more than just that. It's going to be more than just uh, some new features come later after the announcement that it's it's no longer going to be main point upgrade has most of the stuff and you might get some more features throughout the year it would be a regular cadence and i'm like you i want to know what that cadence is if that's yeah. going to become the policy uh i would like a little more you know view into how is this going to happen when am i going to get what right completely agree which is not how apple does things <laughs> no so. As I said, it's a little too loosey-goosey I, yeah. I don't know if they're they're going to be into that but I, I'm fine with that on the OS side. Uh, I don't know if German is saying we're going to get away from the, he's saying like, we're going to still have a new iPhone every year. So mm -hmm. uh, clearly we'll have a new iPhone in September. Uh, I don't know if that means that the Macs go on to do a different cadence. Maybe they do. Um, mm -hmm. It does. It does. Does seem like the only major change that he's identifying here, to me anyway, seems to be that uh, that operating system situation where the updates come as the features are ready, uh, unless we'll do most of them at a time and then we'll trickle out a few the rest of the year. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Let us know what you think and what you would like to see in the mailbag. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Uh, we do a top five on our YouTube channel. And last week I, ta I, ta uh, I counted down the top five smartphones from before the iPhone uh, and got a lot of great responses to these on our Patreon. Uh, for example, uh, Charles says, I still have my Palm Trio and it still works. I bought a new battery a few years ago. A single charge lasts weeks. It didn't last as long when it still had cell service, though. <laughs> uh, but yeah, now that it can't connect to a network, uh, that battery lasts a long time. Shows you how much uh, juice those modems use trying to connect to networks, right? Yeah. And then Bo said, for me, it was the Hitachi G1000 Windows phone launched back in 2003. Uh, rotating camera and touchscreen, plus could RDP straight from the phone. Paid for itself pretty quick, as I could remote in for billable hours anytime, anywhere. Now we have whole whole like websites devoted to helping you cut down from having to remote in for billable hours anytime, <laughs> anywhere. But, but right. back then it was a perk because he couldn't do right. it. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, Nika, thank you so much uh, for hanging out today. It was great talking to you. As always, it's a good time being on with you guys. Where can folks go to find more of what you're doing? You can pretty much find me on all your social media outlets at Tech Savvy Diva. You can also check out my podcast, Snob West Podcast, where we talk all things Apple and then some, along with me and my co-host, Terrence Gaines. Fantastic. Patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. Uh, was the 1800s media worse than what we have now? The Smithsonian's political history curator points out some parallels that include widespread misinformation and influencers run amok in the 1860s. Hey, some things never change. Uh, you can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 hundred UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow. Talk to you then. TNS family of podcasts, helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>